So when you praise something, all right, it lives. And the spirits praise us, we live. But their praise is our life. Their praise is our heartbeat. Their praise is the grass growing. It makes everything live. And everything, when it dies, you have to grieve the hell out of it. Because if you don't grieve it, then it never was really alive. It didn't live. It's already dead. And that's what terrifies the hell out of us. If you have two centuries of people that haven't grieved the things that they loved when they left properly, where does that grief go? It's not like, I mean, it's like that old Einstein guy, you know? It's got to be transferred to energy mass somewhere. It's got to go. It becomes ghosts that inhabit the grandchildren. All of you are carrying them. There's enough work for me in this room for the rest of my incarnations. If there's such a thing. It's a wonderful thing to see that much work out there. But I've got enough of my own, you know what I mean? The mystery is you can't deal with it yourself. And in a land of individualism, they say, oh, well, I'm going to pull up myself up by my bootstrap. A man got to do what a man got to do. Well, a guy's talking like that already infested with grief. That's a person that's talking like grief-stricken for like five generations of males didn't know how to weep. All right? So when I came up on this thing, I really, I really not going to make a talk about what I know. I'm just going to bring it to your attention about that because uh, the solution is not the point. It's a, it's, a, it's a talk about conflict. That's what it is. And as all of you know, I always give the rap, violence is an absence of conflict. People always say, if we think real good thoughts, we're not going to have no conflict. No, if we have a lot of conflict, we're not going to have no violence. Conflict means, once again, the back and forth. I'm not talking about this kind of conflict. That's the absence of conflict when it has to escalate to that hitting, punching stuff. So in village, when these women get rolling, they get rolling and rolling and rolling. And what happens? Then all of a sudden, everybody stands up and starts praising the person that died or praising what happened or the person involved. This one yesterday and the day before when I saw him walking, when I saw him coming, when I saw her walking, when I saw her coming, her eyes were like smoke in the midst of the dawn. And there were two little fires coming across the skyline. And those two fires, one of them was the white twin and the yellow twin and the black twin and the sparkling twin. And they came walking into our camp. And we didn't know that it was our friend, the deceased, that left here. And they go on and they praise this thing. What are they really praising? They're not really praising the dead person. They're praising the fact that they were alive at one time. And that you were there to be with them at that time. It's like you were talking with the Alan, uh, Nolan poem, poem there, the walrus poem. And so this, this ability to do that, why is it uncool? I saw a kid the other day who was great. I was down in Alabama, and they brought me these so-called tough kids, you know. I mean, Alabama tough kids are a lot the same as L.A. tough kids. But they thought they were tough kids. So they were all doing their flat thing. We call it the flat thing. In other words, I feel nothing. I'm as depressed as I can be, and you can't make me close my jaw, open my eye. You know, you try to make yourself as flat as possible. You eat flat foods, I think. I think that's why the sudden, uh, you know, popularity of tortilla has come in. Just to make everything as flat as possible. Thin as possible. You're not supposed to, like, act happy. You're not supposed to act anything. You're supposed to be, like, as much as zero. It's really a hard job to be as zero as you can. It's very different. And the older you get, the harder it gets. Especially, you know, when you start eating more. So I saw this kid, you know, and he was doing this flat thing, you know, making me be happy. I'm not going to be sad for you. And so we were watching him and watching all these other kids following him doing it. And then all the guys were gone, and I saw this kid going across the field by himself, you know, doing the flat thing. And then when he looked around, so nobody was looking, he started doing somersaults. He's like, running around three rocks, you know, <sighs> singing and going along. And some guy came out of the john, an adult. <laughs> so this kid's going to be fine, you know. There's nothing wrong with this guy. He's just being cool, you know. But there's some people, they actually take this very seriously. To be cool and to be flat. I was at, this, I was at a restaurant here the other day, it was Bly. 
and we were trying to get some food, and they had some waiter come over there trying to be like this flat guy, what, he, what Robert calls a deconstructionist. You know, <laughs> I like the word, I have no idea what it means, but, uh, but the idea of being too flat, I've liked that, I've, I've been, I always show up in the youth, whatever's going on, I always showing up with the young people first. Well, I said, well, they developed that. No, they didn't even develop that. They're just playing it out for us to see what we look like. When the machine is your mother, then what are you grieving? Then your real mother goes away. Then that's no machine, man. That's no machine. So you gotta, you gotta have the grief. So if the village, you fall down in village, and you're all, you pull your hair out, and you've been yelling, you don't have to medicate expression. We don't have to medicate expression. We don't have to. We have to give it a place to happen. That's called village. Or some village called community. Old people, young people, unknown people, sparkling people, crooked people, nutty people, every people. Every strange kind. So let's say I'm going along the road. Blasting my head off, doing what would be considered irrational. They would want to haul me into the hospital and give me a little bit of Prozac. Calm me down, cool me out. What good is that? What the hell good is that? Because in the village, the person's going along like this. They say when the tears roll, you have to listen. If a client comes to me and I hate this person's gut, because there's some people in the village drive you up a wall, you know? It's not like heaven. It's a hard place. And some knucklehead will come and he's got a problem. If he starts weeping on my shoes, I can't send him away. By my in-law, I cannot send him away or her away. I have to listen. I have to listen. And I do listen. And I try to understand. And of course, if he's weeping on my shoes, there's a hundred other people listening to. And the whole idea was great is not to solve it. I have nothing to solve. What the hell are you going to solve? You're sad, you're down, you're in that place. Let it rock. Let it rock. Same with being happy. What's so uncool about that? And what's the difference between being there, grieved, or being happy? People didn't know me, didn't know how I am. I never lied to you guys. Man. There's nobody in this room I ever lied to. You're gonna, I'll, I'll say that, I was right here, I've never lied to any of you. As far as my personality goes. Alright? If I'm down, and I'm down, and you're gonna know about it. If I'm mad and raged about my friend being knocked off and killed, you're gonna know about it. I'm not gonna inflict you with it, but you're gonna see it if you wanna look at it. And if I'm happy, I'm gonna tickle you. I'm gonna jump up and down, and I'm gonna take you out for malts. I really am, eventually. <laughs> I owe this girl malt for her brother for a long time. And I make a lot, a lot of happy all around. There's no lie about it. And so the spirit, they like that. You know, medicate expression in the village. You love expression in the village. Because that's heaven to us. It's to be alive at that point to feel to do these things. How do you do it? Because when you fall down in the street dead drunk, hear what people are going to say about you. I'll take to the rehab. Well, there may be a point. There may be a point. Because somebody is a habitual alcoholic. But if somebody has gone into grief and gone deep down and fallen apart, I'm not going to take it to rehab. I'm going to take them in the house. Take off their clothes. Wash them up. Put on new clothes. Put them beddy by. Watch over. Make sure they don't choke on their tongue. And when they get in the morning, feed them breakfast if they can eat it. And they might go out and do it again. And it might take them six weeks to get over it to some degree. Or more. We don't know. Just depend each person what they feel inside their heart. But in the village, you know you're not going to lay there rotting. No one's going to roll you or kick you. You're not going to freeze. No one's going to steal your money. No one's going to take your cattle while you're out. The people's going to watch out for you because they know they're going to be down there too. Sooner or later. Because nobody's not going to have relatives, not going to die. And then your relatives, they're going to see you die too. Hey, yeah. Like what? You're not going to die or what? Or they're not going to die. They're going to die. So what's beautiful about life is being here. So while you're here, you have to make life live. And so you have to praise life all the time. And grieving is part of praising of life. And that's what makes the spirit fat. 
And what makes them happy? To be full of fat, full of this fat, praise and grief, all of this expression. But it's not for its own sake. Now when I say grief, I don't think people should sit around weeping all the time. I ain't talking about that. And I'm not talking about being happy with the glue and smile on your face all the time either. I'm talking about doing it in a way so that the village holds the people up while they're going through it. Like we have some people in this room, we have a lot of people in this room got heavy grief this very moment. This very moment. And well, I mean, <laughs> we all have it. But some got a little more than the rest. A little more than they asked for. And they can't afford to break down. But they, sh they have to break down. Or what's going to happen? Their grandchildren are going to inherit it. In the form of some kind of repression or a disease. So often you go to a shaman in the village, shaman makes divination. And then you come to me and say, ah, got solidified sorrow. It's a tumor. It's called petrified sorrow. If you really translate, it's exactly what it means. Shahabi shukabah. So the sadness turned into a stone. It's not liquid anymore. It's not liquid. Makes illness. Goes all over the place. I myself like this. Everybody's subject to it. When I first lived in Guatemala and I leave this place, they kill about 1,800 of us. What, in six years? Our village alone. All right? People always say, don't you want to go back? Yeah, I want to go back to what was there, but I don't want to go back to that big pile of dead people in the ground. Remember all my friends with shrapnel in them? Pay with American tax dollar. Well, what, am I supposed to hate Americans? No, I don't hate Americans. I don't hate Americans. What I hate was the fact that these people didn't get to be grieved because everybody else had to be on the run while they was being killed. That's why wars are so terrible because they don't have time to grieve. That's why so many people hang themselves, kill themselves during wars. It's not good. It's not good. So if the village is there to make big circle around the people, either metaphorically or literally, and they just make sure they don't bump their heads. <laughs> and of course the people that are watching pretty soon get into it too because they got a lot of things to do too. They forgot about what's his name or they start remembering about their child that died. Like I lost one between my two boys. Yeah. So when I came up here during the war, I came up here and you know, I had to be like, you know, really staunch. I had to watch my backside. I had $5,000 price on my head. They were trying to kill my children and my wife. Everything I had was taken from me, frozen. I had to watch everything. I had to watch the law here because the immigration, everything. Finally got it all straightened out, but I'm still like this, right? You know? It's like, you know, one of those little deer, you know, watching out for the jaguar. And then what happened to me? Bam! My whole body sprang. My whole, this side of my body went under into my armpit. And I was twisted and my hair went white. And I had to be carried around. Nobody could fix it. They take me to shamans and acupuncturists and surgeons and doctors. I didn't even remember. I was so in pain, I don't even remember. Constant, constant pain. Constant pain. I was telling about myself, you know. So then what happened? This guy came from Guatemala. This is, I was in New Mexico. He was from my village. I said, oh great, somebody from the village came. I went to go see him. Well, he had sold out to one of the right wing groups. And he came up to me and he says, you know, it's good to see you again, Martin. We're talking in Mayan and all that stuff. And he says, you know, I sold out to the right-wing groups. I didn't say that, but he said, I'm part of that. And if you come down, I will kill you on the spot. Right between the eye. Bam! Like that. I was horrified. I didn't talk like friends here and I go to the village, you're going to kill me? Well, what happened to me? This man did me the biggest favor anybody ever did in my whole life. He didn't know it. And I'm going to kick him next time I see him. I was in the other world because somebody already killed him. But what happened, <laughs> so I went home and I wept. And I wept, and I wept, and I wept. There wasn't a dry spot in New Mexico. <laughs> Honest to God, man, I drank more water. I had to weep and weep and weep and weep and weep and weep and weep. And I was very lucky because I had some Indians who lived with me, my people, who were refugees like us, who could stand around me and allow me to do that. But I had been this kingpin all that time. And slowly but surely, my body untwisted to some degree. I still carry a huge amount of grief. Huge amount. But also carry a huge amount of praise for life, which I love. And the grief animates that. 
So I know from personal experience how this thing can make you sick. Not just like on the spot. Everybody knows that if you don't cry when you got to cry when you feel like hell. But I'm talking about a long range. But none of these things make any sense unless you have an everyday life. And so that's why rituals are, are zero. This, uh, shamans are nothing, ritualists nothing. All of this ceremony are nothing unless the everyday life is in there. Because it's your everyday life that makes those things meaningful. And you have all these anthropologists coming and trying to pump all the fat out of my brain and find out how you do this and how you do that. So what difference does it make? I can give you the blueprint to the space shuttle. Are you going to fly it? <laughs> are you going to make one? And that's exactly the knowledge I want to use because space shuttle takes thousands of people to make and thousands of people to fly. Just like a village takes a lot of people to fly it. And one person can't make it and fly it. And so to grieve properly takes a lot of people. For one person to grieve takes a thousand people or a hundred people or fifty people to grieve properly. To praise properly, you can get away with it, but the more the better. And then to praise the spirits and grieve with the spirits. Oh, you can do that alone, but it's better with all the people. So when you're working and uh, praising one another, one of the main crimes that is committed, in my, in my you know, estimation, is youth, especially the small little people that are not corroborated for their beauty and for their vision and for anything they might come up with that's inventive. There's a lot of good parents in this room. I'm not really speaking to you, but then you can speak to some maybe. You can tell them about this, see what they think. That's when a youth comes up with an inventive idea or comes up with some kind of, uh, who knows what they come up with? You know, I mean, they just come up with things. It has to be right away looked at, praised, understood. Even, even more than, than you want to. Because they got to know that. Because then that kid's going to be able to grieve. And if you grieve, won't get sick. And also, when you go to the spirit world, that child's tears will feed you. And you'll be able to live off those tears in the other world. Otherwise, the kid's not going to cry for you because you're going to teach him how to praise. And he's not going to know how to praise unless you show him how, that he's praiseworthy. Not going to know how to grieve until he's seen you do it. And know that it's cool. It's got to be cool. It's got to be cool to weep, man. It's got to be cool to be down. It's got to be cool to be up. And it has to be cool to be alive. And all things has to be recognized. And that's why you have to get a, a group of specialists here. You see, you know, we work with the man conference. With Robert Bly and uh, myself and Mali Domasome and all these different guys, you know, John Lee. Just a bunch of them. And we know a lot of these men. And I know men that know how to weep good. And they not only know how to weep, but they know how to feel what's going down without, you know, uh, making you feel bad about it. So you got to get a whole bunch of people together that you don't even know. Because the honor of the grief is a form of praise for the dead. And if it's not given to them, they can't get to the land of the dead. Just hang around here as ghosts and then you got to carry them. And then you can't grieve. And that's what happens in families when you got these big ghosts. You cannot afford to grieve because you got to carry that sucker. You got to carry it. And then your children don't get crushed by it, so you're trying to carry it. So how do you get that ghost off your back? You need a lot of people to help you. You can do one, two, three, you need a bunch of them. A whole bunch of them. It's like this one's here, right here, just like this. A whole bunch of them. It's a feast for the spirit. The spirit comes, ah, I'm gonna drink some tears. But what it weeps is sweet. And the word in Mayan for I feel happy is ki nukush. Honey in my heart. There's honey in my heart. It means the tears of the gods are the happiness that I feel. And the grief that I feel is the food for the spirits for them. And they get buoyed up by it. And that's why you can have grief. You can have grief that's not sadness. You say, what? What? Oh, 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 grief that's not sadness. Hey man, you see your little girl grow up and get married. Well, you're sad that she's not in the house anymore, but you're also extremely and weirdly emotional about the fact she made it to 18 and she didn't get killed and she did. She got through the rheumatic fever and didn't get crashed the car when she drove through the garage and all the different stuff. You're so happy she made it. You feel so sad that she got big and and, and then she's married and some knuckleheads walking off with her, but it's all right too in a way and then have a grandkid and she'll see what it's like and all that stuff you know